Thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Estelle. I'm the organizer of the Amphitheatre tonight. Um, and just before Anna talks about natural language processing libraries, I'm just going to run through a few Our Ladies announcements. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you to our sponsors tonight. Uh, these groups uh, fund us and provide us the venues that we use for our events. So huge thanks to NUS um, for hosting us tonight. Uh, announcement is the uh, Victorian Cancer Bioinformatics Symposium is on. If you are in the bioinformatics space or in the cancer space, and you exist presumably in the state of Victoria uh, in July, you might want to come and attend this. Uh, registrations are still open. I'm not just so sure about abstracts. Potentially still open. Marie, uh, one of the R ladies, she's in an accelerated leadership program organized by Women in Leadership Australia, and she's doing a survey on professional um, self worth of women in STEM field. If you've been in STEM, you've probably seen the scissor graph where we have lots of women in the lower like, um, rungs of the field, and then as you get higher, it always like, decreases down. So she's interested in evaluating what's going on there. Um, before I let Anna come up and speak, I think Linda wanted to spruik something that she's doing. Hi, I'm Linda McIver. I run the Australian Data Science Education Institute. We're a registered charity trying to get teachers to use real data sets and real projects in their classes. So instead of learning tech using robots and drawing pretty pictures, kids do projects that actually create change in their communities. Um, we are always looking for volunteers, um, people to find cool data sets and annotate them and things like that. Hopefully running a hack day again in July. We ran one in March, which was awesome. And um, the R ladies in Sydney did some really cool stuff, so you got something to, <laughs> to spur you on. That's a little competition in Sydney. Um, if you're interested in that, give me a shout. Um, come find me, I'll give you a business card. Or we have our Slack for volunteers, so it'd um, be great to see you guys get involved. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so, Anna is going to talk tonight about natural language processing libraries and the strength of the SPACI package, which I think is run in Cyclin, which I haven't heard of until I looked it up. Um, and a little about, uh, about her, she graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a PhD in mathematics. And for the last nine years, she's been teaching math and doing research in set theoretic topology as well as graph theory and continuum theory. And between November last year and March this year, she's been working with UniMel, uh, their wetwork research team developing online homework content for mathematics courses. And she's been interested in data science for a couple of years since she started to learn to code in R and Python. And since March this year, she's been over at the um, WeHi, and judging by her topic, she's very interested in natural language processing. So. Come up, Anna, and tell us all about it. Thank you, Adele. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Thanks, Anna, and any other organizers that I don't know for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak here today. Am I loud enough? Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so um, I'm quite excited to share uh, awesomeness of Spacey with you. Um, I used it uh, recently in a natural language processing project that I worked on, uh, which was on uh, extractive, ex extractive summarization of um, news or um, articles. Uh, it was directed towards articles. Um, so uh, I like this for many reasons, and I found out that there is a really nice wrapper for it in R, and um, Quite happy to have a chance to share it with you. Um, so just to give you a little bit um, about my background, I already <laughs> told you some of it, but um, I'll tell you a bit about what I have worked on and how I landed on natural language processing. Um, when I was doing research uh, back in the University of Pittsburgh, uh, there were a couple of projects um, that I continuously find relevant in my today's work. One of them was uh, on graphs, namely um, studying connectedness properties in graphs. For example, uh, trying to figure out what kind of graphs would satisfy uh, a property 
such as if you have, say, five points on your graph, can you find a path inside the graph that goes through all the points but doesn't intersect itself? Um, so a graph with such, such um, a property would have many different uh, possibilities for it to branch out and, and make its class. So I was quite excited about uh, working with order structures such as graphs, which led me uh, further to consider different order structures, such as trees and uh, general partial, partially ordered sets. Um, for example, uh, directed acyclic graphs that we all love. And, <laughs> um, and I, I switched to set theory topology, um, where I used a bunch of um, methods from logic and set theory and model theory to study complexities of partially ordered sets, so just complexity levels of different orders. Um, and uh, when um, a couple of semesters ago, when I was tutoring for logic um, at the University of Melbourne, um, I learned about uh, application of logic to linguistics. And it was quite exciting how many things sort of tickled my fancy and um, in, on how many occasions um, there are trees that come in into natural language processing problems and various relational structures that pop up here and there. So it's, it's quite an exciting topic for me to be working on and um, I'm going to try to tell you a bit about it. Now, Text is everywhere. Language is everywhere. We use it for almost everything. Um, and it contains almost all of the information that we try to communicate. Um, but it's very, very hard to uh, make it accessible to computers. So that's what NLP tries to do. It tries to come up with methods and algorithms to uh, make language, natural language, accessible to, to computers. Uh, so anything that would have text as an input or an output falls within the area of NLP. Uh, now, what are some uh, key challenges of working with language? Well, uh, language is ambiguous. For example, you can say, I ate pizza with friends, or I ate pizza with olives. That's very different. <laughs> Treats. <laughs> um, uh, the object, pizza versus, or uh, always versus friends, in a very, very different context, a very different way. Uh, language is also very variable. Uh, you could say the same uh, thing as I ate pizza with friends in a very, very different way. For example, um, friends and I shared some pizza. You don't even mention ate in there at all anymore, but it conveys the same meaning. Um, language evolves over time. For example, we no longer use words such as thou or thou. Um, some of the meanings of words have changed. For example, uh, words objective and subjective, their meanings have flipped around a few times in history. Um, for example, word nice used to mean having high standards. Um, now it's used for everything that's good. Um, language evolves over distance. Apparently, breakfast here is brekkie. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love Australian. <laughs> um, but a uh, good and bad thing about language is its structural complexity. Well, bad thing is that it's a really tough complexity for us to deal with. We're very good at understanding it and parsing it uh, without knowing. But if you ask us to write down um, the rules with which we parse language, we would not be able to do that on our own. Um, well, computers in some sense are better than us in understanding some aspects of language, but there are three key reasons why language is hard for computers to deal with. Um, first of all, language is discrete. It's made out of uh, discrete symbol, symbols like letters, which form words, which form sentences. Um, so that means we, we, we cannot just, just view raw text um, as, 
a subset of um, an Euclidean space or R to the power n. It's it's not um, it doesn't have numerical. It's it's not easy to ascribe numerical meaning to it. Basically, we're going to have to deal with the entire vocabulary as a categorical. Uh, each word as a separate category. So you can imagine how large, if I'm sure you've worked with categories of data before, you, you know how fast your features um, um, multiply. So th this is very, very tough to deal with. Uh, and there have been ways um, to, ways around it um, that, that has been designed so far, and I'll mention uh, at least one of them later today. Um, but uh, more, more importantly, when you try to uh, get your model to output data, it's very hard to numerically arrive at your output step by step. Okay. Um, another complex, um, another contribution to complexity of language is its compositionality. As I was saying, you, you take your characters, you make words, from them you make sentences, or rather you make <coughs> noun phrases, then you make clauses, then you combine them to make sentences of, of different complexity, and then you combine those sentences together to get your texts. And those rules of composition can be quite complex, but in addition, those rules of composition, when we try to, when we try to parse them, we don't just use those rules of composition, we also use um, inference, in logical inference, sorry, <laughs> Re reasoning, we use reasoning, um, and we also use world knowledge. Right? For example, if I tell you uh, the trophy didn't uh, fit in the suitcase because it was too large, what does it refer to? What was too large? The trophy, right? What if I change one word in the sentence and say the trophy didn't fit into the suitcase because it was too small? What? What's too small? <laughs> right, right. So we do know that putting something into something mean, requires uh, one thing to be bigger than, than the other. Uh, so we know that and, well, you can't just uh, infer that from the sentence structure only. You need to understand the meaning as well. Right. By the way, that uh, those pa that pair of sentences comes from Vinograd schema, which is um, one of the really tough challenges of, of natural language processing: trying to um, understand what pronouns refer to or what anaphoric expressions refer to anything that tries to link to uh, aforementioned entity. Okay, and lastly, <laughs> language is sparse. Uh, just again, as we compose different words and sentences and so on, you can imagine uh, possibilities for um, getting different outcomes, possibilities for getting different sentences is huge. You, you, can, you can never write out all the possible sentences because it's just potentially infinite, right? Um, and to exacerbate this further, uh, distribution of word frequencies uh, has this annoying property um, where uh, the frequency of the word is, is inversely proportionate to uh, the ranking of the word in the frequency table, meaning that we have very few words that are very common and most words are incredibly rare. So it's in, or, in order for uh, a language model to learn anything, it needs to ingest an enormous amount of data, which is in some sense okay because we do have enormous amount of text data. Uh, we do have enormous amount of vocabulary that, that we can get from that data. Um, even though quality of some of the data, especially recent web data, is not as good, filled with typos, filled with mispunctuation and so on and so forth. Uh, but still, it has structure. Um, it still has, it still can benefit from uh, the good bits that come from the structurality, uh, structure and the nest of language. Namely, the uh, language is cohesive, uh, which means as 
you read the sentence, and the sentence is linked to each other by anaphoric expressions. You, you always, I, you, you link with pronouns or you link with repetitions, like single repetitions, you keep repeating the same words or synonyms or hypernyms. Um, so in some sense, you keep, you keep uh, connections up. And also the language is coherent, meaning the train of thought is something you can follow. It makes sense. So those two properties of language, in addition to its compositionality, uh, give us the benefit of language being in some, to some degree self-labeled. So while we have this enormous um, amount of data available to us, it, it is in some sense all labeled data that we can try to ingest. Okay, well, uh, why do I like using spacey for um, natural language. Yeah. Some applications <laughs> before we get to that. Uh, so uh, regardless of all of these challenges, it's, it's a very worthwhile uh, problem to pursue because it has a whole lot of applications. Uh, just to list a few, um, we could mine for information from this huge amount of data. Um, we could try to detect entities, try to uh, detect all of these real, wor real world objects that get mentioned, and try to understand what are the relations between these entities. Uh, and if we are able to um, get that information, we'll be able to uh, construct a knowledge base, which will help us with question answering. Uh, which will help us with search optimization. Uh, machine translation is another um, very helpful um, application of NLP. Someone at a panel discussion today at Eliza, a responsible AI meetup, raised a very uh, interesting point um, where machine translation um, is key uh, and it's important to have machine translation uh, available in, in all languages because today most of the information is available in English or European languages. And uh, we want to have everyone have access to that information. So it's very important to have freely available machine translation uh, to everyone. Text generation, which I think is the most popular, <laughs> or at least the most um, popular pure NLP application. Um, one of them being uh, text summarization, other dialogue systems, more colloquially known as chatbots. Um, also speech recognition, for which it's very important for the machine to understand the context um, of the text it's, it's trying to transcribe. For example, if I say, I ate eight bananas, well, the machine is going to want to know uh, which of those homophones um, eight being a verb and eight being a number, which is which, right? It needs to know the, the uh, context. And uh, optical character recognition um, comes into NLP where you try to uh, read text, uh, but also can tell the difference between RN and M because they look the same. So you need some post-processing to uh, uh, correct some of the uh, image processing errors. Okay, so um, while I like Spacey, it accomplishes a whole lot of text processing tasks that go behind applications like so. And uh, among other things, uh, it's very fast. So when you're trying to deal with a dictionary or uh, the vocabulary of 10,000 words, which is considered small for NLP applications these days, and when you're trying to deal with a corpus that's over a million words, which is again considered very small, uh, you do need something that, that works fast and that um, uh, can get you the freedom to experiment and try things. Um, and Spacey uh, is based on, on Cython and, and uh, takes advantage of its data structures and uh, parallelism. Um, so um, it's incredibly 
it's incredibly fast compared to some of the other libraries that I've tried. Um, in addition, in addition to to that, they they've also designed their models in a way they've used some tricks here and there to make their models uh, just work faster. So it's not just um, implementation; it's also their really clever uh, approach of uh, the NLP model. And it also has very wide variety of NLP features, uh, all sorts of um, linguistic features. Um, includes very, uh, very nice pre-trained English models, statistical language models for English. It has several uh, options for language models, several sized, different sized models for you to optimize, for you to balance between speed and accuracy. And it's uh, very user friendly, has excellent documentation on most of it, um, and good code references for bits where documentation isn't as good and has um, a free course for you to get started with. Um, so um, I was quite excited to uh, have it available uh, when I was working on the project. Um, Spacey R is a wrapper around Spacey, um, because Spacey is a Python module. <laughs> uh, so thanks to Kenneth Benoit and Akitaka Matsuo, and I believe also European Research Council, who funded them. Um, we have this uh, wrapper for Spacey's, um, for many of the Spacey's features. Um, when you try to install it, uh, it will install Miniconda and Python and Spacey, and it will run it in the background. But you don't have to install it by itself, it will take care of it for you. Uh, during the installation, you'll, you'll be able to download a model, whichever model you want to use. They have, um, in addition to several English models, they also have models in German, Spanish, and so on, so quite a few other languages available. Um, and if you want to download uh, models later on, you can uh, just run the download function. Um, so you have to initialize an NLP, a natural language processing object, and you should make sure to finalize it when you're done uh, with, your, uh, with your work. Make sure you shut down all of those processes. Um, now, what are the key components that SpaceCR takes from SpaceC? Um, there are two um, kinds of models that underline um, underlying the uh, <coughs> features. Uh, one of them is a statistical language model for, we'll talk about English this time, so let's just stick with English, and another word embeddings. So statistical models gives us all sorts of pre-processing features as well as linguistic features. Uh, and word embeddings uh, come from Stanford's uh, global vector representations for words, um, but I believe they trained their own, but they followed um, Stanford's. Um, suggestions for it. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, I will go through all of these features and if we have time at the end, if we're, uh, or time and energy at the end, I'll just tell you about a few things that SpaceCR does not cover and where we can get our hands on, <laughs> on them. Okay, so pre-processing. Uh, one of the basic pre-processing steps is tokenization, which is uh, <laughs> just segmenting your text into meaningful um, segments. It could be a word, it could be a sentence, it could be a morpheme, the smallest unit of, of, of smallest unit of language. Um, for English, it really makes sense to go with words because um, um, words don't get inflected as much in, in some other languages. But um, I can think of quite a few other languages where we definitely want to split uh, words into further, uh, further morphological units than just words. Um, so Spacey's tokenizer is non-destructive, meaning that you can reconstruct your um, original text uh, from the tokens. Uh, it has this uh, functionality, although example that I present here uh, has lost some data, which was by design because I asked it to remove some things. Uh, 
but if you wanted to have the full uh, tokenizer, it still does the full tokenizing, it just hides some of them from in, in the output. Um, so the process um, follows several steps. Firstly, uh, it will, uh, Stacy will um, split the text on white space. It will preserve any, white, any uh, bits of white space or you have se several uh, consecutive white space characters will preserve that. Um, and after it gets all the strings, it will go through all the strings and see, oh, do I have to split those strings fur further? Is there a punctuation? Do I have to take, split that off? Is there, uh, is this an example, is this an exception word like don't or can't or in this case, she's, do I have to split this further? Um, and it will, in this case, she and apostrophe S are different uh, units, they should be split. Uh, it will detect uh, the um, punctuation and the separator in many bodied and will split those things off as well. Um, but, for example, if it came across um, UK, U dot K dot, it wouldn't split that apart. You would realize that, oh, that's actually not uh, the punctuation in the sense of the end of the sentence. I should keep this together. Um, you can also um, do the sentence segmentation rather than word segmentation. And um, sentence segmentation uh, depends on part of speech. Uh, tags for um, for your tokens. So while um, lemmatization is is rule based, sentence segmentation does depend on your statistical model. Um, so um, the borders between sentences uh, would at least coincide with clauses with, with clause borders. Uh, so if you if you put um, so if, if you take the um, period away from the second sentence, it still detects um, that there are three sentences in there. It's not perfect. A punctuation, punctuation still plays a role in it, of course, uh, because if you try to remove the first um, period, it gets confused and it thinks that the first and second sentences are one sentence. So it's not perfect, of course, um, um, but uh, occasional omitted uh, period hopefully would not be too bad. Um, and that's something we see a lot, especially in the web data. Um, another very common um, pre-processing step is to lemmatize your tokens, uh, meaning to assign a base form to your token. Um, lemmatization uh, also depends on part of speech, yes. So, but aside from part of speech, it's rule-based. Um, it has various lookup tables and suffix rules that it depends on, uh, which English is very kind to supply in a very regular way, uh, mostly. Um, so, if, let's take a look at uh, some of the things that it decides to change. So, only things that are displayed uh, here are only the tokens that were altered. Um, so notice it makes uh, the determiner the lowercase while uh, we no longer have the text up there, but while the name Anander Mianai is not turned up turned into lowercase because it realizes it's a proper name, so I shouldn't lowercase it. Uh, and you notice how a bunch of verbs get turned into their their base forms, uh, and there is a custom token. Uh, for all of the pronouns. Um, and also notice that the word bodied, from many bodied, is not put into the base form body because it realizes that that's an adjective. Um, so uh, if you want to um, add some custom lemmatization rules to put everything into the base form, regardless of its <coughs> uh, of its part of speech, that's possible to do in Spacey. Unfortunately, not possible to do in Spacey. <coughs> um, and last bit of pre-processing I want to mention is filtering for stop words. And um, one of the ways you can do it is to use tidy text's uh, stop words 
um, set and filter that out and you'll notice um, that this will also remove all the punctuation separators uh, while um, the built-in uh, stop word flag of spacey will leave uh, punctuation and separators in and there is also um, a difference in words for uh, the spacey stop words keep the word years in so um, there is no universal stop words set, I suppose. Um, next, I want to talk about linguistic features. Um, why do we even bother with, with linguistic features to begin with? Of course, as I mentioned, some of them um, definitely form groundwork for some of the pre-processing steps. But why do we want to have access to them? Well, um, language. As a, as a raw input is can be pretty hard to parse because words are really what well, most words are really rare words that look different could mean the same thing and um, if you reorder words in the sentence you could end up with very different meaning so it's good to pre-process your text get your annotations uh, get your linguistic annotations and and make use of them, and um, I'll show you uh, how some of those things work. Um, so first of all, parts of speech on which several of our preprocessing things depend on uh, give us, um, well, what part of speech the word is, but also it gives us uh, extended uh, morphological in information. So tag here gives us some extra information about our words. Uh, for example, you can see that um, was and is have different tags. Uh, so tag in this case basically means that uh, was has past tense, while is has present tense, and is uh, first person, sorry, third person singular, while uh, where it's divided is past participle. So it re realizes those differences, um, and you can also see for adjectives, it marks whether or not an adjective is in positive form or um, superlative form. Um, right, and uh, you, can, you can see the full list of um, annotation tags and their meanings on their website. Dependency tags um, come in very handy when you're trying to um, do information extraction because it gives us idea of what are which words group together, how how are those words composed together, um, what are the clauses. Um, it's best understood via. So just the second sentence parsed like so. So we have we can see now that Anna and I is uh, a compound noun. Its leader is a subject, and both of those things depend on the root, the verb. Okay. And if we try to, we will get these trees. And if you try to nip those trees at the bits uh, where there is a noun at the head you'll get noun phrases, okay? And when you're trying to do information extraction, you do want your noun phrases stuck together, okay? Um, now, uh, one thing that I searched for quite a bit and couldn't quite find was the answer to why thousands of years isn't picked out as a noun phrase. Um, because according to their definition, that's what it is. If you have a phrase with noun at the root, that's a noun phrase. Uh, and thousands of years does have noun at the root. Uh, of course, that thousands of years ago is already it has as an adverb at the root, so that's not good. Um, but if we're trying to detect um, the entity of the Russian Empire, we do want to have those words stuck together. Um, so this brings us to entities. Um, again, 
I'm really excited about this because I'm working on the information extraction project right now. And um, it's all about getting entities and getting relations between them. Um, so, as I said a little bit ago, it, entities are just, named entities are just real word, real word entities that have names. And Spacey also has extended um, this concept and included other entities such as dates and cardinals. And you notice that um, the entity recognizer does not just pick out two, it's able to say that it's at least two, so it's like two or more, right? So it's, it's important to detect that it's two or more. Um, the entities recognizer is also part of uh, the, the statistical language English model, as well as uh, the dependencies and tags. And um, all of these, uh, all of this information, all of all of these components are trained on Ontonote's um, data set, which is um, a bunch of regular news broadcasts, newspaper, uh, telephone conversations, um, news conversations data annotated with linguistic features. And I believe this brings me to word embeddings, the second model component of uh, SPACY. Um, word embeddings attempt to take our uh, discrete words and try to embed them into um, a 300 dimensional, much better than 10,000 or 50,000 dimensional um, space where the position of the word actually has a meaningful um, interpretation. Uh, closeness between, uh, the actual positional closeness between words um, tends to um, you make the semantic similar similarity between words. So I picked four words here um, with um, different um, semantic, sorry, did I say syntactic? semantic similarity, with different semantic similarities between words. Um, and using the additional attributes bit um, of the spacey parse function, which is the function in, <laughs> in spacey R, gives you everything as you noticed. Uh, you can request all sorts of extra things to be given to you through additional attributes and vectors and vector norm and whether or not a word has vector, uh, it, it can be um, extracted through those. Uh, and just to give you a bit of an idea of how those uh, uh, semantic similarities would work out, you notice that apple and orange are pretty similar, they're both fruit. Apple and chair, less similar, but they're still both nouns, inanimate, so still positive score. But while you try to um, compare Rumpelstiltskin with apple, it gives you a negative score. Um, the cosine similarity score measures a angle between the two vectors. So um, good thing about cosine similarity is that if you try to compare texts of different sizes, it should still give you, um, if they talk about the same topic, it should still give you a, a high score. Uh, while uh, Euclidean's distance, just actual uh, 300 dimensional distance between the two points should work fine with individual words, but it would, would get uh, quite a bit distorted if you had um, uh, texts of different lengths. Um, so uh, what, what is that word embeddings model that Spacey uses? Um, they use the common crawl corpus, which is years and years of web uh, data, uh, all sorts of web website data, including metadata. Um, and they calculate a co-occurrence matrix, meaning for each word and certain context around that word, they see whether or not uh, 
other words appear in it or how often they appear in it. And then from that, they um, train a log bilinear model uh, to arrive at a 300 dimensional embedding of the words. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so the subject of science similarities, maybe will you show it in the slide before? Um, so they, um, there is this database which contains already all the, all the um, words and has been already curated and so on, and they use that to compute this similar, so do they start from the end? So every word or token is annotated with an entity, is that right? And then, so how, how m my question is how do you, what do you compute the similarity between, like how? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. Uh, each token, not each of them, but whatever is in the vocab vocabulary has a word, has a vector associated to it. Mm -hmm. So if you try to calculate similarity between just tokens, it will calculate similarity between those vectors. Now so if you try 300, 300 dimensional, dimensional vectors, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but if you try to work with uh, sentences which contains multiple tokens, then it takes the average of all the vectors uh, and then compute similarity between the average. So, right. Yeah. Um, and of course, if you calculate the distance, that will never be negative, while the cosine similarity is between every one and one. So it's a bit, a bit weird when you're talking about distances. Yeah. Um, Right, so this brings me to the end of uh, Spacey's, or rather Spacey-R's um, capabilities. There are a little bit, um, there are a few extra things that you can grab from the additional attributes bit. Um, just general shape of the word, does it contain a digit, does it have contain an uppercase, is it like a number, is it, is it a decimal number, or is it number in words? Um, is it out of vocabulary? Uh, what kind of symbol is it? And so on. And the full list is uh, on, on Spacey's website. And don't forget to finalize. Now, what Spacey can't do um, are some of the things that, are, that we really want to do. Uh, for example, scoring the sentiments of our text or linking entities. Uh, which means if you have uh, if you have the same entity mentioned in a different way, for example, if you're going through a text somewhere, it could say uh, the United States of America. Somewhere else, it could say USA. You want to be able to you, you want your model to be able to tell that those are the same thing. So, one solution to this uh, question has been to link entities to their Wikipedia links. And some NLP packages provide that functionality when they go through all the entities and try to find Wikipedia links to them, and that gives us the common base, common reference point for putting uh, entities together. Uh, Coreference resolution that we already talked about earlier, trying to understand uh, the anaphora where uh, one phrase links to, refers to another. Um, pronouns or saying a pronoun mentioned or something like that. We want to be able to uh, link it with the thing that it uh, refers to. And uh, the last bit, the open information extraction, extraction sort of puts these th things together where it tries to get the entities and get the relations between them. So this is like golden news. <laughs> um, well, one package that does all of that and has a wrapper in R is Stanford's Core NLP. It's a Java-based library and it's um, has been um, really difficult to set up. Uh, I didn't actually succeed to set it up on my computer. I couldn't get my Java to work with R and it would crash. So I just did it on uh, Domino as this one of my colleagues suggested. So we still have um, bits out of what Core NLP gave us. 
I'll only uh, show you um, open information extraction and uh, co-references, but as you see, um, it makes use of, certainly makes use of, use of the dependency tree and the noun chunks or various chunking, chunking bits. And some of these um, subject relation object triples are really nice. Some of them are not really nice, but some of them are really, uh, really nice to use if you're trying to build your uh, knowledge base. One thing I wanted to direct your attention to is notice how it's able to detect both she, she is divided into these two factions and she, she is many bodied. Um, even though we have this conjunction splitting the sentence, not quite into two sentence bits, but we know because we're English speakers that it has two sentence bits. Um, but I was quite glad to see that this was detected. And it's also interesting that as a relation for she is many bodied, she put has in there. Um, even though uh, uh, the core NLP also has tokenizer uh, and also has a lemmatizer and it correctly lemmatizes she's as she is. It knows it's is in there. But uh, it's real, it also realizes that this is an attribute rather than a relation, so it makes it into a hat. Okay, and lastly, the coreference resolution bit of core NLP. Uh, this is not very readable in there, but uh, it doesn't give us um, all the coreference bits. You just have to read it out, and it correctly matches the Ratch Empire with its, and all three mentions of Ananda, me, and I are correctly. Now, I'm, this is a very uh, optimistic example because coreference co reference resolution uh, still has very poor performance, I believe state of the art is around 70% now. Um, so this is too good, it's not, it's not true in general. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, these are all the bits I wanted to tell you about and you realize all of that uh, only talks about the pre-trained models that were already given. Um, if you want to train your own models Spacey R, unfortunately, is not going to help, uh, but Spacey could. <laughs> um, so one of the things uh, that we could do is um, redo the uh, word embeddings with domain-specific text. If you're only working with medical data, it's definitely worth running um, the glove model on your own data and get the embeddings that would be much better optimized because when I have tried using the word embeddings for uh, any of the technical terms, it doesn't really do very well. It's for general English. It's, it's based on what, it's trained on that data. So um, it's definitely something worth looking into. And um, entity types um, depend on whatever entity types were available in Ontonode's database. Uh, and those are, again, general entities like persons, organizations, or geopolitical entities like the Ranch Empire. Uh, but if you wanted to add your own entities like statistical models or um, optimization methods, something like that, you would have to add your own. Um, and um, a lot of, there is a lot of um, excitement about uh, the pre-training, um, bird style pre-training that allows us to um, give our models um, a nice head start before we feed in uh, annotated data into it, um, which we could we could train with Spacey, but not necessarily. We could um, try to train with Bert's provided code. Um, so this um, gives a little bit of an improvement on your accuracy if you try to pre-train with with uh, domain specific raw text before you try to uh, train a classifier or a dependency parser or anything on the specific data. Um, and uh, that's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions? Word, word embedding on maybe 
might be like a crisis that tax corpus. Um, so I guess if your tax corpus has like these historic stereotypes that you can work where like particular ethnicities or genders or so forth would be closer in the vector space, particular positive or negative words, like what could be done? If, like if I if I had an application where I really wanted to get rid of that mm -hmm. and wanted to have relatively mm -hmm neutral treatment of particular protected classes. Is there something you can do? Um, so uh, there have been a couple of papers on that, um, specifically in the uh, setting of burden beddings. Uh, there, those burden beddings do carry bias. That's in the text that they were fed. Uh, and there are several solution, well, propositions to deal with it. Uh, some of them was <laughs> trying to post-process the vectors that you get and uh, calculate, the ve calculate the vector of the bias <laughs> and project everything down uh, accordingly. Uh, or you could do similar uh, projecting down before, it will, as it be before the training step to uh, <laughs> separate out the bias element in a, in a protected, separated um, coordinate, you would still preserve the, the um, whatever gender or race <laughs> attributes in them, but they will be separated. Um, now, there, have, have, there has been a lot of criticism uh, for this approach because um, even when you try to remove the gender attribute, things that were biased are still clustered together. So, um, to my knowledge, um, at least with at least dealing with this issue linearly uh, with linear spaces, I don't think there is a solution out there. Um, now, one thing um, one thing that I, I can well not really suggest, but just note that. Uh, if our data is biased, we do, well, we probably want to know how biased it is. We probably want to have, at least, it's really, it really depends on your application, but uh, at least that um, model will represent what the data has to tell you. And then you could manually remove um, the biases in, in given suggestions. Um, for example, um, Oshin Deary and Catherine Bailey have written a paper uh, on this topic suggesting uh, various approaches and I think one of the approaches they mention is when uh, Google Translate um, does a weird thing when you translate from English that has gendered pronouns to Turkish which doesn't and then you go back, it switches a pronoun. So for example, uh, my sister is really smart, she is a university professor, it translates back and says he's a university professor. So um, that, that used to be the case. Uh, I believe they, I believe one solution that uh, they proposed was to give uh, the user an option to choose the correct pronoun. Um, I would have to double check if that's already something that Google does. Um, I'm not exactly sure, so don't think over that. Uh, but like that was that was something. Give user uh, an option. Uh, do some context-dependent post-processing. But that's what our data says. So it's really yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you do an example of a project where you manually just kind of uh, so a lot of these things uh, I used in a summarizer project. So uh, it heavily depended on uh, the word uh, vectors because I really wanted to get an idea of um, which sentences in um, a given text um, were sort of summary sentences, which, which were central sentences that had um, that were connected to many other sentences in there. So I wanted to really get an idea of uh, the extent of semantic similarity between sentences. So I used 
spaces token vectors, but I didn't use their sentence vectors because it was just averages. So um, I followed a paper, I forget by whom, but um, the uh, paper that suggested uh, using weighted averages where uh, TFIDF weights were used, and um, they claimed that gave them the perfect, the best scores. So I followed that. Um, how well a summarizer um, performs, that's really hard to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, hopefully, um, if I'm able to share it with you, I'll ask your opinion on how well it works. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm currently working on uh, building a knowledge base for uh, data science terms. So that a lot of, a lot of open information extraction and noun chunks and entity recognition, those are like really relevant to my work right now. Um, so may you reference the, the paper that was weighted averages? Uh, which paper, sorry? The uh, weighted averages? Yeah. I'll, I'll put on. a link on the comments later. Yeah, so yeah, I totally agree that um, a lot of tasks have in NLP is um, especially for unsupervised tasks, like the one you mentioned, and probably uh, word embedding in the topic modeling. So uh, it doesn't seem we have a good framework to to measure the the performance. Uh -huh. Basically, I mean, if you present it to the stakeholder and um, unlucky try to challenge you, sometimes you uh -huh. have to give some heavy argument. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. a bit difficult to, uh -huh. <laughs> to kind of show the... Um, one of the papers, it, it wasn't necessarily on the uh, evaluation of summarization. It, it was just evaluating, uh, I believe it was title generation for our papers. And the way they measured the performance was they put 10 people in the room, gave them, gave each of them 100 papers, um, and asked them to rank titles that were generated. And uh, what they found was the agreement between the 10 reviewers was very low. Even, even, even to just put the scores aside and just to see whether or not they agreed if it was a good title or a bad title, it's not, not having a five scale um, measures. Even on that, there was a very low agreement. So it's a very subjective um, question. Um, have you had experience with any other um, um, so I believe um, Space Yard comes from the uh, authors of Quantera. Uh, I believe that supplies some of the deficiencies of uh, Spacey. Uh, one such deficiency is um, producing term document matrices, which I believe uh, a few other very nice <coughs> libraries have, but Quantata has it set up so it works with Spacey. Nicely. Um, if you do work in Spacey, the way they set up their models, you don't really need to have a vectorizer or TFIDF vectorizer, but I needed one anyway for my project, so I had to stick sklearn into my project. So it would have been nice if it wasn't there. But Quantata is one other, um, tidy text is another. You, you mentioned indeed that you do some pre-processing with space, uh, space, space up, so space here, mm -hmm. and then some with tidy text. How is it? Because I remember um, working a little bit with tidy text, and it connects well. So it, that it's got like function that allows to go from one format of storing tokens to the tidy token format uh -huh. to, for example, the corpus um, uh -huh. to do the analysis with models. How does what's the format like? How so do you have conversions? So all of those tables were uh, data tables. So any convert and you give it to, so they in interact well yeah, with they interact. tidy text and yeah. it's all more than I Yeah, it, it, and core, core NLP was also an R package, by the way. It's it's a wrapper around the Java core NLP. So it's also available in R and uh, it's a super set of spacey really, but um, well, I mean that's not true. Maybe not all of the flags that Spacey has are present in there. Um, but it, it, most of the things that I listed, at least in their 
base form are available in Cornell P. It's just slow and <laughs> huge. <laughs> so yeah, spacey is evil. <laughs> I have uh, two questions. One being a bit of a meta question, I guess. Like, is there a landscape of difficulty? Like, I would imagine that different languages, like you said before, like English is kind of kind of nice in, in many ways. And uh, then there will be languages like Turkish where you don't get the benefit of having um, <coughs> gender pronouns, which might make association easier and so on. Is there like a landscape? Has anyone mapped out a thing like that where we know like, oh, this is like, a really, this would be like the Mount Everest to climb for NLP. Is there such a thing? I haven't worked in any other languages, hmm. um, to be honest. Um, well, actually, I have worked in Georgian for a little bit, and hmm. all I had to do was try to deal with noun cases, and it was sufficiently painful, and I couldn't find anything ready out there. It was just all, just noun cases, mm -hmm. and it was, it was very hard to work with. Um, luckily, I mm -hmm. had a finite amount of things to the case. So yeah. And that would be just different languages. What about areas? Like, uh, is aerospace engineering easier than medicine, or is there a, what's the... <laughs> Maybe that is, maybe that's actually not all that dif different because there's so much Greek and Latin words in medicine, whereas whereas I guess or legalese. Yeah, uh, good question. Um, yeah. I don't have a very meaningful question yeah. answer to that. Yeah. And my other question is um, a bit more frivolous. Um, I've just learned that was it black metal or death metal? There was death metal. Death metal. There's now AI generated death metal. You can tune into a 24-hour <laughs> AI death metal channel on YouTube, um, and there were. Previously, there were um, uh, services, at least in Germany, you had a service where, as a blind person, you could dial a number and then they would read prose or poetry for you uh -huh. on the phone. That was a free free service, free public service. Um, is there anything artsy, or we've seen, we've seen Google Dream, right? So is there anything artsy like that in the NLP space? Is there anything that we can look forward to? Because the Raj Empire is, is by Anlecki, that's not by an AI. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Although she does advocate AI rights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. GPT-2? There's, there's something similar to it, but not in NLP, but it's in computer vision, where they can essentially just, it's an app that they've created. Like if you're a black person, you can put it off and it'll identify things. Like mm. you're shade shopping. Yeah. Like that's a red top or a green top. Mm. Kind of thing. Yeah. It's it, like they've done it in computer vision. I don't think they've started doing so much for NLP as well. Yeah. Somebody suggested for, um, processing uh, fan fiction as uh, a side project. That gave us Twilight. I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 also gave us Fifty Shades of Grey. I think with like, the computer-generated Harry Potter sequels. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's really funny. The computer captures it wrong perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the biggest hurdles um, is one point that you touched on is that the natural language processing still has such a long way um, to go in terms of capturing sentiment. Um, how far off do you think we are before um, we can capture sentiment, before we can um, uh, educate a, a program to, to be able to understand sentiment? Um, um, this is a bold claim, but um, one of the podcasts that I <laughs> recently heard uh, was talking about, I was interviewing someone from a company that specialized in sentiment analysis uh, in different languages, and it sounded like most of their work was very rule-based. Um, so that makes me think that very far away, but, uh, but on the other hand, uh, I believe there was a blog post that compared some of the key sentiment analyzers like uh, Vader and Sentry WordNet with Google Sentiment Score, which was doing a very good job. Uh, but I don't know what model they're using. Vader and uh, Sentry WordNet. Okay. 
going back to that thing about language difficulty, I was just thinking, because English is such a mongrel language, <laughs> if it's just more difficult because of that, like, it's inherited yeah. so many things from other languages, if that just yeah. adds to its complexity, because mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to imagine doing anything in Georgian. It's um, the, the verbs are incredibly complicated, and you could just have a full sentence in a verb. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I, I can't imagine what a tokenizer would look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Hungarian would probably be similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, out there. <laughs> Has so anyone done sarcasm detection? <laughs> <laughs> That's almost like a phrase that does what it's asking for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty recursive. Yeah. <laughs> it would be good to see. But that's an, that's an interesting point with the Georgian and, and Hungarian. Do you reckon there could be like, um, what's the right word for this? Like, um, uh, do you reckon there could be like linguistical tent poles that that give us the basic structure? The English, I guess, is fairly similar to German. Like, I'm German and I have no problem learning English mm -hmm. because there were so many structures so similar and so many um, words were, were were so similar. Especially yes. now that the Germans don't even call milch milch anymore; it's all milk now <laughs> uh, because it's so much cooler when it's English. But it's <laughs> but it, they, they were, the structures are so similar, and I guess. Yeah. French is like one step away with all their adjectives being like in this sort of, you know, they're being like the steps on or something. And there, is there like a, a gradient, I guess, with languages? Like uh, that? Yes. So uh, if you look at spaces code, uh, you can see that there are bits that are um, language, they're, they're for all languages, and then there are language specific bits. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe the part of speech, the unextended, the basic part of speech is general. And then the tags, the um, morphological extension, the bits with uh, extra morphological features, those are English specific, mm -hmm. um, for example. Yeah. So yes, I believe there is. Which other languages would you choose if you had to sort of make a model that would then make it the easiest for everyone to extend spacey to, uh, to all languages? Like, which one would you have to cover? <laughs> Esperanto. Sounds <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, You mentioned graphs in your introduction. Are you able to produce um, graph sort of diagrams using um, oh, the dependency parsing? Yeah. Um, that's a spacey feature. Doesn't get, didn't right. get a wrapper for it for okay. spacey yeah. Can you combine it with, I think there's a package called iGraph or something like that. Are you able to combine any of the scores for no. that? No. <laughs> Are we done with questions? <laughs> And I reckon we give another round of applause because that was an awesome talk. <laughs>